Every once in a while in dinosaur paleontology, a truly remarkable fossil discovery will be made. These revelations often provide a tremendous deal of amazing new information about the world of non-avian dinosaurs and secure a prominent place in the history of research on these animals. One such finding was Scipionyx samniticus, an incredibly unique dinosaur discovery that turned out to have preserved parts of the internal organs of this creature for over 110 million years. Scipionyx was originally uncovered in 1981 in Benevento province, Italy, about 30 miles northeast of Naples, in a geological formation dating to the early Cretaceous, approximately 113 million years ago. The person who discovered the dinosaur was amateur paleontologist Giovanni Tedesco, who apparently initially thought he had found a sort of fossilised bird, and began preparing the specimen himself in his house, attempting to strengthen the fossil by removing parts of the chalk covering it and putting vinyl glue onto the bones, as well as placing extra slabs of rock around the outsides, including a section with a fake tail to complete the missing part. It was only in 1993, allegedly after watching Jurassic Park, that Tedesco took the specimen to paleontologists at the Milan Natural History Museum, where they recognised that this was in fact a non-avian theropod, and therefore the first non-avian dinosaur to be discovered in Italy. Later in 1993, the find was then first officially reported by the scientists, with quite a bit of attention being drawn to the fossil due to its title as the first Italian dinosaur. The fossil was again mentioned in an article in 1994, but it wasn't until 1998 that it actually received an official name and description. In the years leading up to its naming, more preparation work had been done on the specimen, removing the fake tail and exposing more of the fossil material, and that's when the researchers made an even more remarkable discovery, as they realised that the preserved remains of large parts of several internal organs were present in the specimen. The 1998 description of the dinosaur made the front cover of the prestigious journal Nature, and the name Scipionix samniticus was given, in honour of both the geologist Scipion Brieslak and the Roman consul Scipio Africanus. Intense research on the specimen continued for the next few years, and in 2011 a huge monograph on Scipionix appeared in publication, describing in immense detail the anatomy, phylogeny and paleobiology of this organism. I've been fortunate enough to actually see this remarkable fossil for myself when I visited the Natural History Museum in Milan last summer, and it was absolutely amazing to see. But one thing that's a little surprising is that the actual skeleton of this dinosaur is really quite small, only 23.7cm, or just over 9 inches in length, not including the missing tail. There are a number of indications, most notably a lot of unfused bones and a relatively large head with big orbits, which suggest that this Scipionix individual was not fully grown at the time of death. In fact, it was probably only about three days old when it died. The adult length of the species is thought to be somewhere around 2 metres, or 6.5 feet. The 2011 monograph on this dinosaur provides an incredible amount of information on its skeletal and soft tissue anatomy. It's actually the most extensive description that's ever been done on a single dinosaur species, and this highly important specimen has therefore provided paleontologists with all sorts of unique insights into the internal organs of non-avian theropods. Soft tissue had been found preserved in non-avian dinosaur fossils before Scipionix, however this specimen is particularly special due to it preserving so much of the internal anatomy, with parts of almost every major internal organ group being present in the fossil. Sadly, no external soft tissues of the integument such as scales or feathers have been preserved though, although there are horn sheaths on the claws, and the paleontologists do say that based on the phylogenetic position they found for Scipionix, it is likely that it possessed some proto-feathers in life. It's through the particular physico-chemical conditions of the environment in which the dinosaur died and was buried, possibly a shallow lagoon or coastal region with oxygen-deficient areas, that the unique fossilisation of Scipionix occurred with internal but not external soft tissue being retained. Almost all of the remains of the soft tissue parts, other than the esophagus and remnants of the liver, are actually preserved in three dimensions, not just as imprints, having been mineralised over time and replaced by calcium phosphate. This replacement allowed for superb detail to be maintained in the soft tissues at a cellular and even subcellular level. Additionally, some parts of the remains are formed from thin films of chemical compounds originating from inside the animal as its carcass decayed. Probably the most obvious of these preserved internal organs are those of the digestive system. The large mass in the centre of the fossil is the preserved duodenum, the first section of the small intestine, and parts of it are fossilised as an internal mould, allowing, incredibly, folds of the mucous membrane to be viewed with the naked eye. The duodenum also appears to have been pretty much held in place after death, with the descending and ascending loops still in the positions they probably would have been in during life. 
the other parts of the intestine also appear to have been preserved, including the jejunum and a very short ilium, as well as the rectum. Plus, there's even a fecal pellet still preserved in place. The first parts of the digestive system, including the stomach and esophagus, aren't actually physically preserved, but their position is able to be inferred due to the presence of tiny bone and scale fragments in a location consistent with the esophagus, and a cluster of small bones where the stomach would be expected. The paleontologists that studied the fossil suggest that the stomach didn't preserve due to it being dissolved by the gastric juice after the animal died, decaying too quickly for fossilization to occur. The respiratory system is another bit of anatomy that didn't completely survive, with no lungs or air sacs present. However, there is a bit of the trachea which seems to have been preserved, with between 8 and 10 small ring structures present in the neck area which look very much like the supporting tracheal rings found in many animals. There are also preserved soft tissues that were found in and on some of the bones of Scipionix, including some patches of what appears to be the periosteum, a type of connective tissue that covers bones in life, in addition to microstructures within the bones such as internal blood vessels and individual osteocytes, a kind of bone cell. Then there are the remains of cartilage on bones too, with cartilaginous joints of the backbone and limbs being identified from organic films coating regions of the vertebrae and the articulating ends of the limb bones. The cartilage on the vertebrae is again an indication of this individual's young age at death, since these types of joints are only present in juveniles and eventually disappear as the skeleton matures. Masses of muscle are also found in several locations across Scipionix's body, most obviously in the base of the neck where they're actually observable with the naked eye. The preservation of the muscles are so good in some cases that intact bundles of myofibers can be observed, and even further beyond that the actual sarcomeres can be seen too, which is just mind-blowing. There's also a halo of reddish looking matter located between the forelimbs of the fossil suggested to be the remains of the liver, which itself had not been preserved but had left minerals derived from the dinosaur's blood. The 2011 monograph confirmed that this red matter had indeed originated from the breakdown of this animal's haemoglobin, and was also associated with bile pigment residues, strongly suggesting that this is indeed a trace of the liver. The heart of Scipionix was also not preserved, but the monograph suggests that some of the blood remains could have come from that organ too, as well as possibly the spleen. As I mentioned, the horny claws of the theropod have also been preserved in the fossil, on all the claws that are actually present at least, showing that these structures would have significantly extended the curvature of the cores of bone underneath them. The claw sheaths have a darker coloration on the upper surfaces compared to the lower ones, which also seems to suggest that, like in many living tetrapods with claws, the top had a harder and thicker layer than the bottom. And it's not just new parts of dinosaur anatomy that have been revealed by this remarkable specimen. Inferences about the lifestyle of this particular animal can also be made thanks to the exceptional preservation of the fossil. The preserved remains of Scipionix's last few meals can be identified within the fossil, and considering how young this individual was when it died, this might actually include everything it fed on in the short time it was alive. In the position where the esophagus would have been are a series of scales and bones that were probably regurgitated during or after death, and in the location of the stomach, as I mentioned before, is a grouping of small bones that probably belonged to a small Lepidosaurian. There are more Lepidosaurian remains in the duodenum, composed of two small clusters of scales, as well as a nearby fish vertebra. In the jejunum are then several more fish vertebrae, followed by fish scales in the faecal pellet. So the paleontologists were able to reconstruct the chronology of Scipionix's last meals of at least five different organisms. First, at least one small teleost fish between 4 and 5 cm long, followed by an even smaller 2 to 3 cm long fish, then a 10 to 12 cm long Lepidosaurian reptile. Fourth was another Lepidosaurian that was potentially as big as 15 to 40 cm long, after which it consumed some much smaller unidentifiable vertebrates. The estimated length of the large Lepidosaur between 15 and 40 cm is not certain, however the paleontologists note that if this prey item really was this big, then it would prove difficult for this tiny dinosaur to have hunted it down itself, potentially hinting at either some scavenging behaviour, or maybe even an indication of parental care having taken place, with this baby Scipionix's parents feeding their offspring a large reptile they had caught themselves. The classification of this dinosaur has been a bit of a challenge for paleontologists, due to the fact that only one specimen has been found and that it's a juvenile, since younger animals often display different characteristics to older individuals and tend to show generally more basal traits, this makes the placement of Scipionix among theropods uncertain. However, in the 2011 monograph it was assigned to a basal location among the compsognathids, after a phylogenetic analysis was performed, finding this to be a likely position for the dinosaur. 
However, the authors note that they cannot say without a doubt that this is where Shipionix should be placed. There's much more that could be said about the wonderful Shipionix, and I'd recommend having a look at the monograph if you're interested. It goes into so much detail on the anatomy, physiology, and environment of the dinosaur. And if you ever get the chance to see it in person at the Milan Natural History Museum, then definitely do. It's really quite amazing that the perfectly timed circumstances of this tiny baby dinosaur's death over 100 million years ago led to one of the greatest paleontological discoveries of all time, and the incredibly improbable sequence of events that must have occurred to bring this dinosaur to the attention of science is just amazing. It really makes you think about all the other potential game-changing specimens out there that we'll never know about, either due to them being destroyed over time by natural forces, or just disappearing into private collections where they can never be studied. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed this video on such an amazing fossil and learned something new. A big thank you to our Patreon supporters, especially our Dinosaur Tier supporters Mayers World, Darkerot, Nicole Bueno, Dominic Bathy, Mark Fawn, Alex Hawke, and George Fostak. If you would like to find out more about our world, its history, and the wonderful life that surrounds us all, please feel free to subscribe to the channel if you think we deserve it, and if you would like to see more from us.